Again, I'm Professor John Down, teaching a couple of the this 100 seconds, and today we have our final panel on the finance major. So, a uh, great panel tonight. Uh, Professor Rich Greta is going to start us off today. He's been a key part of the finance group here at the University of Portland for quite a, a number of years. Uh, so, he's going to talk to you more about the classes as well as uh, some of some of the various careers in finance. We've got people in all different kinds of companies that have gone through the finance program here. So, yes, great to have you here for this, Rich. And then we've got Nick Fisher. Uh, Nick graduated in finance back in 2001, 2000, yep, 2000. And then uh, has worked in a number of financial services companies, which he'll kind of share some of that experience with. He also got his MBA here, which he finished in 2010. Yes, and, uh, and then started a, a, a finance company called Pilot Wealth Management where uh, again, he's co-founder and he manages the investment portfolio for that company. So that's a pretty exciting venture that uh, hopefully you'll share something about. And then we have Ryan Keane on the end here, who graduated in 2011 and uh, works in the construction field for a very uh, uh, growing construction company called O'Neill Electric, where you do all kinds of financial analysis and manage projects. So uh, another interesting application for the finance major. So I will uh, turn it over to you, Rich, and, and uh, let's let's uh, welcome the panel here. Okay, my purpose is to talk about. Can you hear me back there? Uh, to talk about the finance majors and possible careers in finance, and then. Let these guys tell you about their experience. Both of them were students of mine, so uh, I taught them everything they know, but not everything I know. Uh, basically, finance to me is a fascinating field, especially right now with all the chaos in the markets. I teach the core course, Business 305, so it's kind of a gate course if you want to major in finance. And the handout that they're sending around will tell you a little bit about the routine in the course. Um, then I want to talk about possible careers. In the intro course, we cover basically corporate financial management. We talk about what financial managers should do, not necessarily what they always do. We talk about the goal of financial management, which is value maximization. We talk about how you get there, finance, investment, and dividend decisions that get you there. We talk about basically how to value common stock and bonds, how to design optimal portfolios, how to hedge risk, how to measure risk, and then how to hedge it. Uh, we talk about leverage strategies and the dangers of over leverage, which is endemic in our uh, economic environment right now. We talk about dividend policy. The course is very problem oriented, uh, and it requires uh, a little bit of skill, more than a little bit of skill in math and statistics. But the careers that flow from that are fascinating. Our elective courses, once you take 305 and are exposed to corporate finance, you'll see if you like it that much. Um, if you can, you know, if you like the quantitative nature of it. If, it. if you don't, then you may not find finance as your field. But if you like it, then there are different paths that you can take. We have a, a whole number of different object, uh, 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 elective courses I teach. Uh, investments, the core investments class, and I also teach real estate because my MBA um, is in real estate. Uh, we have other people that teach in options and futures, financial markets, um, applied portfolio management, uh, international finance. And once you've seen the core finance class, you'll start to get an idea of which of those courses is more interesting to you. There are three basic careers that you can go into. In, in finance. The first one is investments and security analysis. The second one is corporate finance, uh, financial management, or basically management for not-for-profit firms. And the third is banking. Uh, the first investments, there are two career paths you can follow. One is you can go after a designation called the CFP. I used to do a lot of investment counseling. I don't anymore. But the CFP is kind of a union card. It's relatively easy to get once you've gone through an undergrad program in finance. 
Um, and it allows you to sell yourself as an advisor, okay, to uh, clients. An exciting field now, because you can do a lot of good. There's a lot of fraud, a lot of abuse out there that we've seen from the dot-com bubble that burst in the year 2000 to the real estate bubble, which burst in 2008. Uh, there's a huge group of people that are making money that need help. And you can teach them how to invest. You can make a lot of money and have a lot of fun. It's very uh, person-oriented. The other career path in investments is the CFA. I am a member of the Federation. It is um, a much higher level designation. There are three exams. I can tell you that the first exam, the flunk rate is almost 50%, uh, because people don't take it seriously. But it's a valuable designation. The average salary of a CFA is much higher than the average salary of a CPA. Uh, only about 15,000 people hold that designation in the entire US. It's now global. They offer the uh, exams globally now. Uh, it's a great designation. Most of the people that take it have MBAs. But I just had one of my uh, first London business students back in 2002, Bobby Brown, who passed the third level of CFA. It's very difficult for undergrads to do it, but he's done it. Um, most of my students that have taken it and passed it, there's about seven of them, uh, are, were MBAs. Uh, you might want to consider that once you get into my investment class and you take applied portfolio management, we can start talking about what's, what's the necessary study program get that designation. As far as corporate finance is concerned, that's more mainline decision making, the investment financing and dividend decision that every financial manager goes through. Um, and that, uh, that particular uh, emphasis uh, requires different selection of courses, basically. The third is uh, bank. You can go into commercial lending at banks, uh, basically applied financial analysis. Uh, interesting, it's also usually a second so banks don't pay that terribly well, but usually uh, you can uh, get yourself in a position where you can jump ship. And I've had a number of students do that who have gone with the West Bank or First Interstate, moved up the food chain, and then got rated by their client borrowers into corporations at much higher salaries. So that's a third possible but again, you're not going to know until you go through the core finance class and start to see exactly what finance is all about. What are the skills necessary? I put that on the chart. Uh, you need a good working knowledge of accounting because accounting is the scorekeeping that we use uh, in finance to analyze uh, companies and to figure out whether we're going to grant them loans, whether or not they're going to uh, prosper or whether they're going to fail. The second thing is strong background in mathematics. Um, I know that terrifies some people, but it's important. Uh, calculus especially. There are things that we do in bond valuation which involve partial derivatives called interest rate risk. It's a major risk right now because if interest rate goes up and the marketplace bond prices fall. And there's a concept called duration and con convexity in the market. And they actually use these things in the real world. So you have to know at least basic differential calculus. The third skill you need is statistics. Uh, because we measure risk and return. We use uh, mean variance models, mean covariance. Um, and hedging strategies in portfolio theory are very, very important. They involve covariance theory. The third thing you need is a strong background in Excel, because a lot of what we do, uh, we rely on Excel to measure growth, to set up optimal portfolios and everything like that. So it's a skill you want to bring out of here. Okay? So those skills are important. We'll teach you most of the stuff. You just have to, I know a lot of people are afraid of mathematics, but let me tell you, uh, once you get into it, you find that it's pretty interesting, and you can do it. It's just that if you're terrified of it, you don't try, you're never going to. But finance, uh, I can tell you when I started with my undergrad program, and then I got to my doctoral program, and what, what I teach in the classroom now is radically different from what I had in the classroom. 
the field is becoming <coughs> very quantitative. You've got to know that. That's true in a lot of other things. Marketing, if you don't know statistical analysis, you don't know a little bit of math, you're in trouble. So um, I urge you to think about that. You're going to take my course whether you like it or not, you're a business student. And don't believe what you hear out there. Especially what my wife tells you. It's all false. <laughs> so, who can tell me what finance is? Anybody out there? I looked up the definition, and it says this that finance is the science of the management of money and other assets. I kind of disagree with that, to be honest. And uh, not to, to discount what Dr. Gritted had just said, because there's a huge foundation you must have, uh, as, as, as he was saying. But there's a really interesting thing that we, that we interject into the, into the finance field, and that is human behavior. And uh, I believe one of the comments he made in, in corporate finance is uh, you know, how managers opt to make decisions, but don't always. And so human behavior is, is a very new area uh, of finance and is, and is fascinating because uh, we're not always rational, humans aren't. And so while you certainly need this, the, the, the science and the math background as a foundation, you have to know those basic, uh, those basic parts. There is this huge other area um, that, is, that is developing. And in the area that I work in, just to give you a little background, uh, I work on the investment side of things, so the, the, the first area that Dr. Krita had, had mentioned. Um, for me, I'm a little ADD, and uh, frankly, I uh, didn't see myself working for someone because I'm a little more entrepreneurial as well. So the investments uh, was, was much more interesting to me because I could go out and uh, you know, carve my own path in, in, in a sense. And whether I work for someone else or, or uh, work for myself, there, there's still quite a bit of independent uh, work that you can do. Um, one of, the, one of the most interesting things to me was if you look at the three most important things in, in, in people's lives, what are they going to say? Uh, maybe you have God and, and religion if, if you're of faith. Um, you know, many people would say family, and the third would be money. And I felt that there would be a huge opportunity to influence the way people were um, looking at their money through wealth management, through portfolio management. Besides that, there's a huge opportunity in front of us. So as of, as of 1998, there's some research that came out, and it's been furthered since then, but $40 trillion of wealth is going to change hands in the next 30 odd some odd years. And knowing what I know now in terms of uh, discussing things with business owners and investors, uh, just because people have money doesn't mean that they're making sophisticated decisions. And there's definitely an opportunity to influence and, and have a really good time building some deep, meaningful relationships with clients and, and, and help them do that. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the, the soft skills that are also uh, an opportunity to, to, to work at in finance. And, you know, I think a, a, a lot of people uh, do look at finance as, as very quantitative and and it is becoming much more quantitative, and, and those skills that Dr. Greta mentioned are crucial. But more and more we're recognizing, because of, as I mentioned before, the, the human behavior side of things, that there are other skills that are very useful in, in the areas of finance as well. I'm no expert on those, but certainly dealing with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, I have many anecdotal uh, uh, stories of, of that. Um, you know, on, a, on a individual basis, at my company, we looked at three companies this week. And they range from manufacturing to e-commerce to just simple sales and, and distribution type of company. And they ranged very much so in how large the companies they were. And surprisingly enough, just because the company was large didn't mean they made more sophisticated decisions. So there's a, a huge opportunity to build relationships with people and help influence the decisions that the managers, that the owners of those businesses that the investors are making with, uh, with their household. Um, so
So I was also involved with the e-scholars program here at the University of Portland. And uh, as was mentioned, also graduated in, in the MBA class. Um, I guess if I could give a recommendation to, to, to you all, uh, given where the job market is going and given where opportunities uh, exist, uh, I'd say a couple things. First of all, uh, being a lifelong learner, being someone who's continuing to build themselves is absolutely necessary. A lot of the research shows that the amount of time that us younger folks uh, hold down a job compared to perhaps what used to exist is less and less. And so there's almost this need to reinvent ourselves. And with innovation and changing in technology and even in a boring field, in a very mathematical, statistical field like finance, it's changing rapidly and things are happening. And, and frankly, it's pretty exciting. So being a lifelong learner and continuing to, to better yourself is, is almost a, a necessity. Um, you know, I guess from, a, from my perspective, when I was a college student, it was really easy to get meetings with people. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the most, I guess, influential things that I can remember from, from being in class, actually in one of Dr. Grizz's investment classes, he invited a speaker to come in who was an antique collector. And that was one of the most fascinating things because people who are out there doing things, who are out there working, can really teach you a tremendous amount about the real world. And the real world has application all over the place. There's, you know, uh, reading about science and biology and chemistry, a lot of those have applications within the finance field. Uh, I mentioned human behavior and psychology, sociology. Um, you know, just, just be a lifelong learner and really take it all in because it has application throughout uh, the industry. Um, I guess, uh, you know, one of the last things I, I would say is, you know, being in the investments and wealth management field was kind of a rude awakening when I first, uh, I guess, graduated from, from college. And I realized that there's so, there were so many salesmen uh, in the industry, I was, I was kind of shocked because I figured that if they were managing people's money that they would know how to invest. But really there was a lot of, of salespeople. And you can't discount, I guess, the, the, the knowledge that you're gaining school and you really need to think uh, about the careers that you're going into so you can build up your knowledge, build up your um, your context. Because if I would have just done a little more research in, into the field, I probably would have realized that there were some skills that I was lacking. And I might have chosen a different career direction right off out of college. Um, so get out there and, and talk to people. Uh, you know, not that, that the foundation that we can get here from, from, the, from our professors is not crucial, but get out there and find out what's happening in, in the job market and in the marketplace to prepare yourself, because it'll be here sooner than anything. Well, like, uh, like Dr. Down said, my name's Ryan Keen. I graduated in 2011, so actually not long ago, when I was in uh, the very same seat uh, you guys are right now. Um, I actually had kind of a non-traditional, um, I guess, route to UP. I started actually at Gonzaga. And coming out of high school, I actually uh, grew up in the Portland area. Didn't want to, didn't even look at UP as an option. My first, you know, graduated, I wanted to go away from home, you know, kind of get away into the college life. So uh, the Gonzaga University had a uh, entrepreneurship program that was four years long, highly touted. Uh, you had to apply basically before you got to college. And so I went up there to basically be a part of it. And I always knew I wanted to, to be in finance, like coming out of high school. So that was kind of, you know, international business and finance was kind of my gig going in there. What I found is that the people that applied for the entrepreneurship program at Gonzaga actually didn't want to be entrepreneurial, but rather kind of wanted to use it as a stepping stone for their for their career. Uh, they wanted something on their resume that they could kind of tout coming out of graduation, right? So the people that you're actually surrounded with in that program um, weren't, weren't the entrepreneurial people that you, know, you kind of wanted to be associated with. So I made a drastic decision my sophomore year. 
kind of felt it out my freshman year, stuck around my sophomore year just to make sure I wasn't making a bad decision, and ended up uh, deciding to transfer to UP. And I actually applied to the entrepreneurial program here before uh, making the transfer. So I came down here and I started taking uh, Dr. Gray's classes, um, knew that kind of finance was a, a role that I wanted to get into, and knew that construction was uh, something I had a passion for as far as development and, and associated activities, but basically didn't have the engineering background that a lot of people in the field had. So I spent one summer, I stayed in Portland, and I uh, took Rita's uh, real estate finance class with a bunch of, well, a few MBA, a handful of MBA or, uh, students, and it exposed me kind of to the finance side of development. So now I have kind of this background in development, but I had no practical experience in project management and engineering and associated activities. So I graduated and I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii for three, four months and basically work with a developer over there that was developing a chain of bars on the island. So it wasn't too bad, fresh out of college, you know, uh, I'm going to go live in Hawaii for three or four months and work for this guy opening a bar, right? Sounds like a pretty smoking good deal. <laughs> so I jumped ship and went over there and lived there for four months and uh, kind of cut my contacts back here, learned a ton of just, you know, hands-on field experience and ended up taking a phone call in July um, asking me if I want to interview for a job at an electrical firm back here in Portland. And I was like, well, you know, my gig is, is I'm a finance major. I have this finance background. I've taken a few, you know, real estate classes. Um, I don't really know electrical. And the guy who was calling me was like, well, do you have any willingness to learn? And I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll soak it up. I'll do whatever you want. I'll be a sponge. Uh, and he said, all right, well, why don't you call me when you're thinking about coming back to Portland. At this point, I hadn't a lot of thought of plane ticket back or anything. And if you're still willing, uh, and I have a position open, uh, we can talk. So I ended up deciding to come back just after Labor Day. Um, flew back, interviewed the next day, and actually started working the day after. Uh, no experience in electrical, um, so they started me out. A lot of construction firms have uh, cash flow problems. Um, basically, you bill out for a month on the 20th and you forecast for the end of the month, but then you don't get paid until, you know, could be two to three months later. We're building the TriMet line um, right now, going out to Milwaukee, mm -hmm. and we haven't been paid since August 15th. Mm. That's uh, over half a million dollars outstanding just on that project alone um, that, you're, that you're without at this point. Now you run into a lot of issues with trying to basically keep enough cash in the door to pay to make payroll while not you don't want to draw your you know line of credit if you can help it. So I started out doing a lot of that and doing a lot of Excel spreadsheets that I go to Dr. Gray, you're gonna live in Excel, you're in finance. Um, and you know, every week basically I do a snapshot, I created a a spreadsheet to help give our senior PMs a snapshot of what their project looked like at a moment in time. So every week they can track it week by week basically to see what what allocation of money went for you know labor, miscellaneous materials, where it was all coming coming from. Uh, I think it helped basically forecast um, project completion, any type of any type of over expenditure you're going to catch early in the project rather than when your job's uh, wrapping up. And it's easier to correct problems early rather than late. Uh, so we, we worked through a lot of the financial modeling. Uh, I started out by doing a lot of like uh, equipment uh, leases and purchases and you know negotiating with suppliers on, on purchase orders for, for large projects. And then kind of swung into more of the project management. So basically, with you know, with this finance degree, um, I kind of did it a little bit non-traditionally. I didn't really stick with the investments and the you know the 
the wealth management portfolio that, that's something you are definitely going to uh, to go into. Uh, but one of the things I did do, because I knew that I wanted to stick around in the finance field eventually and get more into the development. So in order to keep my financing uh, skills kind of up to par, um, I actually did some consulting for a firm in Portland that did option valuations for startups. So we do, we take them through their Series A round um, for option valuations for minority shareholders uh, and give a purchase price on their option share. So I did that for, you know, five to six months about just to stay relevant in that field because uh, I know at some point that I'll probably go back a little bit more uh, in depth in the, in the finance, whether it be in development or something else. Okay. Very good. So I think at this point, we're going to open it up to questions. Yeah, let's give them all a hand. To, uh... Could you hear that? And if you could, can you repeat it a little bit? Yeah, so the question was, uh, she mentioned I worked, I worked at a CPA firm for a while. Uh, she was asking, is it, is it uh, advantageous to have an accounting degree and, and get the CPA as well? And frankly, I think it is advantageous in some respects. There are quite a few very good wealth management uh, folks who, who have accounting degrees. Uh, you know, paramount in, in, in understanding what a company is doing is understanding you know where the money's coming from and in today's world accounting is becoming uh, much more complicated and to be able to understand uh, the intricacies of, of what are happening on a balance sheet or, or in our statement uh, are, are, are pretty critical um, what's your what's your name? I think you know I agree with Nick it, uh, if you're interested in investments I push people to take both semesters of intermediate accounting because uh, Getting into the accounting data, and really analyzing it becomes much more important. So that's important, a very important skill. You have to take the intermediate one in the finance major, but I always tell people to take one and two instead of cost accounting. If you're interested in corporate 
finance and pay costs one and two. Now, some of the accountants disagree with me, but uh, <laughs> my experience is you're better off that way. Very good. But also chime in on something that Nick said about behavioral aspects. Um, there are textbooks out now which are titled behavioral investments. And virtually every investment textbook that we use has at least a chapter on behavior and how people's emotions and uh, uh, idiosyncrasies affect decisions. Plus, there's a new theory. I mean, we teach uh, what are called markets, uh, diversification portfolios, which are based on normal distribution. There's a new book out called Black Swan. Nothing to do with it, Natalie Portman. <laughs> I hated it. My wife thought it was beautiful. Anyway, the Black Swan uh, requires a very, it's based on an efforts of mathematical theory called uh, fractal geometry. Uh, and the author of it has become a big celebrity on late night talk shows. But it basically looks at uh, what we call a barbell strategy in investments, where you hold safe investments for most of your portfolio and then flyers at either end. Because you don't get a lot of market movements um, that are really outstanding. The black swan is named after a phenomenon in Australia. If you look in the Webster's Underbridge Dictionary, uh, what is a swan? It is a white waterfowl. Okay, white. Uh, though I can tell you because I live above the wetlands and I see the swans. Uh, the, the babies are, are great. They're not black. Someone discovered in, in Australia a colony of black swans. They're genetically identical to swans in this country, but they're black. So Taleb, the mathematician that came up with this theory, talks about the black swan. That's the thing that you don't see that hits you. Okay? It's based on a mathematical theory called catastrophe theory, which is much different than chaos, which is what we teach in our derivatives courses. Much different. And it's become very controversial. There's a book out called The Black Swan. Lay people can read it. I mean, he doesn't get information to mathematics. Cool. All right, any other questions out there? Great opportunity here. Okay, we'll wrap it up and thank the panel one more time.